In the name and spirit of Jesus Christ, welcome to this time of worship and praise to God on this first Sunday of Advent. Welcome old friends and new, whoever you are and wherever you are on this journey of life and faith, you are welcome here into this Christ-centered, inclusive community called to ministry. I pray that you had a safe and restful Thanksgiving shared with those closest to you. And the sanctuary now is adorned with trees and greens in anticipation of Christ's birth. There are many opportunities through UCC Norwell to engage in this time of waiting and reflection, including Monday morning prayer time, musical meditations, pray and play, the gift drive for department, uh, the Department of Families and Children's Services, the outreach meal packaging event, the racial justice challenge, and of course, a virtual offering of our annual Christmas celebration concerts. Also throughout these weeks of Advent, we will be distributing hundreds of white doves to our church family. We ask that you stop by the church to pick up these doves for your family when you are able, write a prayer on them and return them to the church so that we can hang them here on our tree, united in prayer. Then, as part of your Christmas worship kits, you'll receive a dove to hang on your tree at home so that you may hold that prayer of joy or concern on your heart. So come now, let us worship God, preparing our hearts for his birth. Would you be with me in prayer? We come in hope this morning, Lord, to hear your word and brush up against your presence. Transcend the distance between us and unite us as your faithful people, those who seek to love and to follow and to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this time of longing and struggle, darkness and anxiety, help us to stand with confidence and joy at the coming of your redeeming light and life into this world. Prepare us. Make a way where there is no way. Amen. to see you. For the next four weeks for Advent, we are going to have some fun with what's called shadow box scripture, where we'll tell the old, old story through shadow box theater, playing with light and dark and shadows, remembering that God is in the light, but God dwells in the dark and the shadows and everything in between. And so we invite you to kick back, relax, and enjoy the shadow box scripture. Shadow box scripture. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 45. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth 
to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren, for nothing is impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me? that the mother of my Lord comes for me. For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Lighting a candle is a simple yet profound act. It is a testimony to the power of light over darkness. When we look at the world around us, we see people living by the threat of a virus that has taken lives, closed down businesses, and turned screens into churches and classrooms. When we look at the world around us, we see anxiety and suffering. But as we light this first candle of Advent, the candle of hope, we see it shine so brightly that we're reminded of a light that has the power to overcome the darkness and despair of this world. A reading from Isaiah. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord, for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. As we light the candle and begin this new Advent season, we wait in hopeful expectations for God's new age. We wait for Christ to be reborn in our hearts. We wait for our prayers to be answered. In our waiting, 
may the light of Christ shine hope into the hearts and into our world. Within the shadow box and hovering over the greens of the Advent wreath, the good news comes to us today from the prophet and the angel, do not be afraid, hold to hope, for nothing is impossible with God. 700 years span Isaiah and Mary, both the prophet and the angel anointed to carry the hope of God into a world that had every good reason to despair. Isaiah anointed and sent to a divided nation, a people just emerging from Assyrian oppression, returning home for the very first time to find the city emptied out, businesses shut down, storefronts boarded up, and the temple nothing more than a pile of rubble and ash. Not at all the grand homecoming they had envisioned. Mary, an unwed pregnant teen, to birth a child under a Roman rule, where people woke up every day in fear for their very life. Herod killing newborn babies in Bethlehem at the news of Jesus' birth. We think our presidential choices are bad. This is the world that God is born into, appearing to a people who needed prophets to speak of the rubble being rebuilt and the city renewed. These are the circumstances ripe for revelation and only made possible through a tenacious hope that persists through the impossibilities to plant oaks of righteousness in the ruins of our lives. In wombs we thought to be barren and under the auspices of governments we believed to be too powerful to turn. This Advent, Preaching a word of hope and wading into the echo of an empty sanctuary, we lean in a little bit closer this year to hear the angelic refrain, do not be afraid, for God comes into the world through hard things, the struggle and the pain, the quiet waiting and patient hope. Not the hope that fills our house on Sundays this time of year when the jets are playing, Cat's out of the bag, Bill's a Jets fan, so he well knows about disappointment. Not that kind of hope. But the hope of God that has the power to live in you and me is different from that kind of wishful thinking, wouldn't it be nice kind of hope. It's the kind of hope that really matters. Hope that gets you out of bed when depression sets in, Hope that sees you through chemo by somehow putting one foot in front of the other. Hope that carries you through the confusing cloud of grief and lifts you above job loss and relationships that are broken. Hope that keeps you going through homeschool days of a pandemic and a family-less Thanksgiving. Hope that resurrects the church when decline and death come knocking. Hope that inspires Paul's hand to write from a prison cell while waiting for his execution of a hope that does not disappoint. Hope that you can only find on your knees, pleading with the Lord. Hope that lives beyond what is possible for who hopes for what is seen. But even for a soul that's built for endurance, hope is hard to maintain the belief that nothing is impossible with God. Some days we may have it and feel its joy bubbling up within us, even in the midst of a pandemic, trusting that we will get through these times, that the vaccine will come, children will return to school, the economy will bounce back, and brighter days lie ahead. Other days, hope will disappear altogether like the crabs my son and I try to catch along the shores at Minot Beach, reaching down under the water and into the sand. Some are simply too fast for us to scoop up, and they slip back underneath the sand without a trace, as if they were merely a figment of our imagination. Hope can come and go, disappearing for seemingly no reason at all, 
and in its absence we will toss and turn all night long to the tune of our misgivings, anxiety, and despair. It's hard to maintain hope, and it's hard to commit to a hope that matters for fear of disappointment. We protect ourselves and others by managing expectations. Bill's adopted, and when he turned 18, he wanted to seek out his birth parents. His mother had discouraged him from doing so, not because she was scared to share the relationship with his birth family or that she didn't want that sense of wholeness for her son, but because she didn't want him to be disappointed. She loves him so much she wanted to protect him and feared what he might discover. Sometimes we temper our hope in order to reduce the likelihood and magnitude of disappointment that may come as a result of it. But hope that matters, when we really have it, it's stronger than any fear of disappointment. It's powerful enough to sprout up from the ruins, to bind up the brokenhearted, and crown us with a garland of beauty when we stand in the ashes. That kind of hope. You'll know when you see it. In the child searching for the birth parent, in the parent towing the hard line of tough love for their child searching for sobriety, in the spouse turned caretaker, in the wounded soldier learning to walk again, the hope that matters. I saw it some years ago. A student minister at the growing yet still struggling Wollaston Congregational Church When the pastor there, Reverend Dr. Mary Louise Gifford, had walked into that church, she walked into the rubble, like the nation of Israel that Isaiah addressed, tasked with the hard work of restoration. The steeple crumbling and a handful of people left in the pews, standing in the ruins of the glory days long gone by, when the big stone church had served as the hub of community life on Wollaston Hill. By the grace of God, her ministry had brought it back from the brink to know meaningful mission and ministry and life again. With God, all things. Even still, when the grant money ran out, the debt the church carried before her arrival once again threatened to cripple their ability to move forward. One Sunday morning, I sat beside her on the altar, listening to her preach under the weight of the peeling ceiling paint, the dwindling budget, and the boiler on its way out to a people who had done everything within their power to resurrect the church again, literally resetting the foundation with their own hands, hosting youth mission trips, kids' vacation camps, community meals, and block parties. The scripture that morning Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, the psalmist cries out, how long, O Lord, the preacher cries out, how long, O Lord, will our efforts be stifled and suffocated by a well of debt and lack of resources? And the way she asked the question so urgently and so earnestly, I finally understood that Just as when David asked it of the elusive, hidden God who had all but forgotten him, it wasn't an indictment of God's inaction, but an attempt to summon the hubris, gritty hope that a life of faith demands. How long will the virus persist? How long until the sobriety lifts, until the cancer is gone, until the job comes through, until the relationship is repaired? until justice is realized. We stand in the breach between the unfailing hope of a faithful people who will not quit and the not yet promises of God. There in the breach, the prophet speaks and Mary heeds the angel's call. Several Christmases ago, a parishioner gifted me a silver pennant that if you hold close enough and look hard enough, you can see holds a single mustard seed. And I keep it close. Because, you know, sometimes our faith, it feels that small. Sometimes our hope may not look like much. 
It may be so small and so delicate that it has to be held in a tiny square cushion box and encased with glass so that it doesn't roll away and get lost. It may be nothing more than a question. How long, O oh Lord? Or how can this be? But as the question itself indicates, it's there, the hope is. Just like the crab that disappears underneath the sand. A hike in the woods, a call from a friend, the companionship of a dog or a purring cat or a long, deep breath may offer you a big hope when yours has grown small. It's no coincidence that as the pandemic set in, our neighborhood exploded with four-legged friends. <laughs> sometimes we need to look to others for hope. And sometimes hope may come as it did for Mary and the prophet simply by speaking it out loud. I have hope in a promise that is not yet fulfilled, in a Savior not yet come, in a story not yet finished, in a God still speaking and a Spirit still moving. That's crazy, you say. Maybe. But all hope is. For who hopes for what is seen? And hope, you know, starts with a breath, with a word speaking the not yet into reality. For the word was with God, and the word was God. Amen.
Dear Lord, when we think of 2020, a flood of emotions overflow in most of us. We can think of the lost opportunities, the missed family events, the changes in our jobs. There are so many losses, uh, but really the loss of close human interaction that we so enjoy with others is probably what we miss most. Today, we pray for hope and strength. Hope. We pray that we can view the world through hopeful eyes, reminded that nothing is impossible with God. And we pray that we continue to be reminded that hope is everywhere. We can see it. We can see it in frontline workers' commitment and resolve, in educators learning to teach in a completely new way, in churches figuring out how to stay in touch and serve their congregation and the community, even though their doors may be closed, in families and friends finding new ways to stay in touch, in record numbers of Americans casting their votes, some standing in very long lines to do so, in people willing to peacefully protest to have their voices heard, and in the news that multiple vaccines are showing promising results. Hope is like the framework of our life, but strength takes work and commitment. We can all have hope, but can our strength endure to bring that hope to fruition? Strength is something that does not come easily, but is built up over time with effort. Strength can be that of an individual, or a group. Think of an individual trying to walk over a body of water on a single piece of straw. They would not get very far. However, if you build and multiply those pieces of straw and the community, town, and nation stick together, the potential and strength is limitless. And that bridge can be built. We ask that you keep those mentioned in this week's prayer list in your prayers this week. We now offer our prayers to you, silently whispered and spoken aloud. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with us the prayer that Jesus prayed? Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved ones, there is so much to be grateful for today. I am so grateful for you, for this church, for the ways that you are reaching out and loving your neighbors, the ways that you are sharing the good news and the hope of Jesus Christ all around you through your acts of service, through your everyday kindness, and through your giving to this church. UCC Norwell is a self-funded church. That means that everything that we do we do together with your help. And so we ask that if you have not filled out your pledge card yet, that you would please do so, and that you would think and pray and talk together 
about how best you can use your resources to make the hope of Jesus known in this world, and that you would give and give generously. Let us pray for these gifts. Oh, holy God, you have given us so much. You have given us a beautiful world. You have given us a resilient community. And so we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to be generous. We ask that you would increase everything that we have given and that you would increase our imaginations so that we might see your kingdom coming on this earth. All this we pray in the name and the power of Jesus. Amen. Friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.